We ask for your mercies upon us in this time of study, our own minds, our own thoughtfulness. We pray and ask these things in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. We want to continue our study in Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, concerning him, speaking of, uh, I think, the covenant there coming through Melchizedek and speaking uh, of of Christ, the, the combination of that idea of the covenant. Concerning him, we have much to say because of these things it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of their practice or practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. This morning we want to open up, we kind of ended right here, it was uh, right at the ending last week, Uh, go back and refresh our minds just just for about a, a minute. The Hebrew listeners have become confused like infants and toddlers. The Hebrew listeners have become confused like infants and toddlers. Uh, we're being reminded here of there's, there's this issue of they, they, they're partaking only of this milk and they're not accustomed to the word of righteousness. They're not really digging into these truths of the word of righteousness. And um, it says, basically, you're, you're an infant. And the Hebrew listeners, they've become like infants and toddlers. They are immature babes who are not training themselves to be discerning. They are immature babes who are not training themselves to be discerning. Now, first of all, we want to note the term for infant or babe. One writer says, sometimes the term babes or little children is used in a good sense. We are commanded as newborn babes to desire the sincere milk of the word. But here the word babe is not used in a good sense. The apostle charges the Hebrews with being weak in the faith, babes in understanding, and says there is probably a reference to their attachment to Jewish observances and their desire to remain under the bondage of the Jewish observances, which he elsewhere terms the elements of the world Galatians 4.3, weak and beggarly elements. So that's kind of where we ended uh, last week. And I want to uh, begin this week with uh, another quote. Uh, John Gill, an old Baptist, had a good thought here. He says, this word is used, speaking of the word for infants, this word is used sometimes by way of commendation, he says, uh, which we've, we've noted that. Um, he says, but in this, in this sense, it's expressive of some good characters of the saints, such as harmlessness and inoffensiveness, humility and meekness, a desire after the sincere milk of the word. Now, he gets that out of Scripture. So you see this contrast and comparison that you have with the idea of the milk and the infant Sometimes the idea of the milk of the word is something positive, and then here we're looking at it as saying you're still on this milk when you really shouldn't be, and so therefore he's using it as a negative. Gill goes on and says, but here it is used by way of reproach and denotes levity and inconstancy, ignorance and non-proficiency, want of digestion of strong meat an incapacity to take care of themselves as standing in need of 
teachers and principals. Now, he used the word tutors and governors, um, but essentially in our realm, uh, that's the idea of, of teachers and principals. Um, you know, you send a child off to school, and what you're saying is, is I'm putting this child under the care of these other adults because this child can't take care of himself. You feed and take care of little infants and babies because why? They can't take care of themselves. We used that illustration a few weeks ago, right? Um, Addison wasn't born, and then in about two or three weeks, uh, we just kind of laid her in the floor and said, all right, figure it out, Addie. Go on. You'll make it. Is that what we did to her after a few weeks? Is that what we did to her after a few months? Is that even what we did to her after a few years? I, well, you weren't in our house, so you don't know. But no, we didn't. Okay? Now, now she's off on her own. <laughs> but we won't talk about that either. But you don't do that to an infant or a child. You don't do that to them. But he says, you know what, that's the way you've reverted back, is that you're having to be taken care of. You have the incapacity, he says, to take care of yourself. He says, for everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. This is a charge. It's not an accusation in the sense of just slinging accusations at people like, political rivals do with each other. He's bringing a charge. The Hebrews writer is bringing a charge against these Hebrew listeners to say, if you're like this, you're an infant. If this is where you are, you are an infant and you are not growing. In verse 14, but solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. I want us to take some time to pick this verse apart a little bit because it really starts to help us open up and think about chapter 6 properly. What is the meaning of the word senses? Well, one writer says the noun here meaning sense or translated sense, means its faculty or capacity to understand. They're not training their faculties. They're not training their capacity to understand. What do you do with a, with a babe? You train them to eat, don't you? They start out eating how? In bottle or nursing, all right, and then you start to try to feed them some other types of foods, and what do you do with the child when you put them in the little booster or high chair or whatever it is you do with them, and you're holding them, what, what do they, what do you do? You start to try to teach them to eat, and the first thing, especially boys, little boys, but babies like to do with their food is they do what with it? They grab it with their hands. A lot of times they smash it, and then they... <laughs> right onto their face, right? And we laugh at that, and it's cute for a little while, but if they're doing that when they're 10, it's a little problem, right? So over time, we're training them to do what? Take that food in and eat it correctly. We're giving them the capacity. We're training the faculty of their motor skills to learn how to eat in our Western way, okay, we still have finger foods. Other cultures have more finger foods than we do. But even in cultures that have finger foods, they generally, as adults, don't smash their food on their face. They might drink out of a bowl or they may use their hand to eat bread or use some type of bread as a dipping uh, or as a way to dip something and eat it. But they don't generally just take their food and smash it to their face. Even in those cultures, there's a capacity being trained. There's a faculty being trained. You learn how to eat in a particular cultural way. He says here, 
this faculty, your senses, this faculty, this capacity to understand, it's not being trained. Furthermore, the idea of the phrase for practice who because of practice have their senses trained, the idea of the phrase for practice and train is expressed in this way, according to one writer, this training is accomplished by constant use. The Greek word here means a state of resulting from training, not the process. There's a state here that's resulting from training. He's not talking about the process. He's not giving you this outline of 42 things to do and you'll become mature in pure godliness and be perfect. He's saying, no, this training, this, this that is happening, this is a state. Maturity is a state from the process itself. This is a little bit of a a way of him expressing the difference between what's happening with the Jewish reader and what ought to be happening with the Christian. The Jewish reader is going back to the old sacrifices and ceremonies and the laws that they can do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then at night go to bed and say, well, I did A, B, C, D, E, F, G, God loves me. And he's saying, no, 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 you're not understanding. You're going back to these things as dead works. Look at verse 1 of chapter 6. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Don't go back to the dead works. We need to be looking at maturity in Christ. This maturity he's talking about is primarily uh, a, a means, a state resulting from training. Whatever this maturity is in Christ, you're not going to get it by doing nothing. Whatever it means to mature in Christ, you're not going to to get it, to understand it. I'm not saying get it as though you can arrive at it and and have it in complete possession perfectly. I'm saying that we're going back to the idea of of the sense here, the, the capacity to understand something. Whatever maturity is in Christ, you're not going to understand it by doing nothing. But whatever maturity is in Christ... You're not going to understand it by works-based righteousness. Maturity in Christ begins with repentance and faith in Christ alone to save us from the debt and the guilt of our sin. And that work being procured through the work of the Holy Spirit, regenerating us, enabling us to believe, and then that spirit carrying us on to sanctification that we would mature in Christ, not in dead works. The problem for the Hebrews listener is is that they continually are going back to the dead works, repentance through dead works. And he's saying no, If your belief is in Christ alone, that's been a work of the Spirit in you. Because remember, he's already talked about the Holy Spirit in a couple of different places in the letter and connecting the work of the Spirit with who the Son is. Remember, they are not doing righteousness training. They are staying in and near the word of righteousness, which is resulting in a state of abled discernment between good and evil. I'll say that again. They are not doing righteousness training. 
It's not like special forces training and you go out and you get all the righteousness because you're special forces training and then all of a sudden you're a, a righteousness seal. Uh, that didn't sound right, did it? it sounded kind of weird. Not like a Navy seal, not like the art, art, art seal. Okay. All right. They are not doing righteousness training. They are staying in and near the word of righteousness, which is resulting in a state of able discernment between good and evil. Yeah. I think I'm about to say all that. Good work. Good work. I'm going to repeat what Scott said with more detail and make it way longer than what he said. Because that's, Scott, Scott does good work. It comes very short. I do long work. It takes a long time. The Jews had historically looked to train in righteousness, which led them to legalistic righteousness apart from the Messiah. The Hebrews writer desired to express the importance of the word of righteousness being rooted and grounded in the Son of God. The Son is the picture. It's been the picture since chapter 1. When you are grounded in the Son of God, the one true bill, as Scott put it, right now they're looking at the 50 different counterfeits And he's been pointing them all along to the one true bill. When you're rooted and grounded in the Son of God, who is he? He gave them four chapters of who he is and said, here's the true bill. You guys are off here in the counterfeit land and you're wandering around and you don't even know what the true bill looks like. He says, no, I've already told you who the Son of God is. You knew that before, but now I've given you elementary principles once again. He said, and if you'll be rooted and grounded in the Son of God, that leads them to love the law and meditate on it day and night. Now, I want you to think about that that distinguishing and distinctive factor. The Old Testament commands us to love the law and meditate on it day and night. Does it not say that? That was there for those in the Old Covenant, and it's there for those in the New Covenant. Love the law of your God... And meditate on it day and night. Now what's the difference in the view and the concept of it between the old and the new covenant? Scott? No, no, go ahead, say it. One was external and one was internal. They were trying to Meditate on the law day and night by the externals. And they weren't seeing the Messiah rightly. And when the Son appeared, the Messiah comes and gives them the proper picture. Why is the Son the proper picture? Can you and I achieve the law perfectly? Can we? Ah, thank you. At least we got that part. Okay. No, we can't. We're not able. Not only are we not able, we don't even... We don't even desire it, want to. And yet when the Son came, He was able to love the law and meditate on it day and night and live it perfectly... And he was 
willing and successful. Able and willing. We are not. He is. If you walk away from the truth of who the Messiah is, the command to love the law and meditate on it day and night will simply be external. But if you are focusing on who the Son is, properly understood, to love the law and meditate on it day and night will be internal. You will actually enjoy it. You will enjoy the context of it for yourself. And you won't walk around trying to place the law on everybody else's head all the time. See, that's what the Jews want to do. The first thing we're going to be worried about is who. Number two goes along with Scott's identification. I think it's helpful here. Recognize the elementary principles of the covenant that are stressed here in this chapter and before in the chapters leading up. Recognize the elementary principles of the covenant that are stressed here and before. If you, don't, if you do not understand the elementary principles of the covenant, you will not discern your helplessness in the first Adam. If you do not understand the elementary principles of the covenant, you will not discern your helplessness in the first Adam. Letter A. The first Adam committed the first and greatest sin due to a lack of discernment. He did not discern the word of God properly. He had not been walking in God's law and light in a way that when the time came to look at the temptation that he was ready to discern between good and evil. He ate. All those that follow the first Adam, letter B, all those that follow the first Adam by their nature and will, they live in the, sin, in the same sinful rebellion and lack of discernment as the first Adam. All those that follow him have the same nature and will after the fall as the first Adam, and they have that same sinful rebellion and lack of discernment as the first Adam. And they're even in a worse condition because now they have no ability in and of themselves, to love the law of God and meditate on it day and night. Do you use the word discernment? What exactly are you using? You did not understand this system? No, discernment is looking at the, in the sense here, in the, he, in, in the Hebrews letter, is looking at that which is before you and saying, no, I won't do that. I see it. But no, I, I won't do that. I understand it. I understand what it is. I have capacity. And I understand what the choice is set before me. And because I understand all the implications before me, I won't act upon that. It's a process. Discernment in and of itself is using that capacity you have. He had the capacity. He knew who God is. Not a good English way to say that, but you get what I'm saying. He knew God. He knew God's command. He had capacity to understand the command. And when he stood before it, at the time of the temptation, he did not discern properly. And therefore, not discerning properly, he acted upon in a way that went directly against God's command, and therefore his sin hurled the rest of humanity into a state of inability to choose God, love God, and know him 
in and of themselves. Now what's strange here is the Hebrews writer has been reminding them of certain things, but he hasn't gone back and really just dug into the whole idea of Adam because these Hebrews are understanding of this elementary principle. This is in their background. Yet, they do not see the elementary nature of the old covenant and its promises being fulfilled in the revelation of Jesus Christ. The disconnect is not that they don't understand Adam and his sin and what he did. The disconnect is, is they don't see the Christ and who he is and what he did as directly dealing with that. The problem is they see Adam and then go, you know what? I'm going to go back to all of these things over here and I'm going to try to work myself out of it. Now what's that sound like in, in the modern idea of broad religion today and broad Christianity today? Roman Catholicism is full of works-based mentalities. Full of it. If you'll go to confession, then you can do penance. Say so many Hail Marys or whatever it is. Judaism is still there in the background. What, what do other world religions have? Okay, Ar Arminianism does have the effects of that. But what about other world religions? Islam, is it not works-based? Okay, so in, in the Islamic way, you have works-based righteousness through the dietary laws. All right, what other religions? Seventh-day Adventists have food laws. Buddhism, is Buddhism not works-based? The idea of good in Hinduism and Buddhism is that you're producing that in and of yourself. All of that is a denial of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the Hebrew listeners here are not seeing their need for Christ rightly. He's pointing them back to that true bill. You're looking at all the counterfeit stuff, and you're trying to find righteousness. You're trying to find meaning in all the counterfeit stuff. No, you're not looking at who Jesus Christ is. You actually do need him because he is the second Adam. He did things that the first Adam did not do, and he alone can do it and was willing to do it, and he did do it. So if they're not seeing the revelation of Jesus Christ rightly in that light of the covenant, they are not growing in the righteousness of Christ, but falling back to the righteousness of man in the perversion of the purposes of the old covenant. We have to see these elementary principles of the covenant rightly to see our need for Christ. Do you see who you are in and of yourself and that in and of yourself you are of the first Adam and you cannot save yourself we won't be so willing to do away with Christ and to walk away from the truth of Christ if we'll understand ourselves in light of the first Adam and this is the problem with the world uh, the other day, I, I, I turned on a, a football game, was watching a little bit of that with the boys, and there was some commercial, I don't remember what it was for, but it went through this whole thing about people are good in this way, and people are good in this way, and people are good in that way, and it gets to the end, it goes, and people are good. Some commercial, you know, product, whatever it was. And I'm thinking to myself, that's the world right there. Here's whatever this product is. They're wanting you to buy their product because they're appealing to your desire to see yourself as good. And then at the end, they just tell you you're good. You're good. You're okay. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> 
Instead of the internal, the internal would say, if, if I were trying to obey one of God's commands, the internal would be, I would do that because I understand I, the capacity of discernment is there to understand that God has uh, commanded that of me for my own good. Instead of saying, you know what, I really want to fight against this, so I'm going to buy this oven that keeps me from doing it. So then I can say, I didn't do it. I'm righteous. It's wrong. Yeah. Yeah, somebody else had said something to me about that. I'm glad you brought that up because I thought to myself, is that really real? It is, apparently it is real. Well, you, I mean, you, you're getting the idea of they're not seeing themselves in a covenant way. They're not seeing themselves in light of, of, of their covenant head, who is Adam. And they're not seeing their need for the second Adam, who is Jesus Christ. The old covenant, number three, the old covenant came with promises that were fulfilled during the old covenant, but always had far future implications and final fulfillment. The Old Covenant came with promises that were fulfilled during the Old Covenant, but always had far future implications and final fulfillment. The people were promised a seed to crush the head of the serpent, weren't they? You realize Christ's coming, and when he came, and all that was completed in him at his resurrection, that's still in the, the, the last little part of the Old Covenant and him fulfilling it, right? Right? Yes. And that continues to be the issue for, for reading the, the Bible in proper context. Everything that was given to them in the Old Covenant was never for them to be able to make themselves righteous. It was always a display. You were looking at those things in, if, in maturity and understanding as, you know what? There's going to be fulfillment of this. The seed that was promised, there's going to be a fulfillment of that. I can't be the seed. Did Moses ever say he was the seed? Did Abraham ever say he was the seed? No. The seed was promised through the line of Abraham and Moses. Did Noah ever say, I'm the seed? Did David ever say that? No. The people were promised a vast blessing through the line of Abraham. How was that blessing fulfilled? In Christ, Galatians 4. The people were promised a land for themselves with their sovereign God. That was fulfilled. Where, where was it fulfilled? In the Old Covenant, right? It's fulfilled. It happened. And even when it did happen, the people struggled to believe it, right? The people were promised a firm forgiveness of sin through shed blood and sacrifice. How did that happen? Through Christ. Those who understand these principles are the growing ones who desire to live by faith in Christ alone. They are maturing further so that they discern between that which is evil and that which is good. If you're ever walking away from the sun 
and you're putting all of it back on yourself and your self-righteousness, then that's not maturity. The believer is always growing in the truth of who Christ is, looking at the true bill, not the counterfeit. Now, does that mean there, that, that we just completely separate ourselves from the Old Testament? No. And why not? What does the Old Testament do for us in the context of the New Covenant? All right, it continues to point us to Christ. I heard somebody say something like that. It continues to point us to Christ. True. What else does it do? Huh? Okay, it does convict, but it convicts in some particular ways. All right, it shows the futility of self-righteousness, works-based righteousness. Paul's been teaching us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, right? All of that was for our good. It was an example. All those things are illustrations for us. There were some growing in their understanding of Messiah, trusting in God, and there were some who kept on in works-based righteousness. And every time the people kept on in works-based righteousness, what were things that they went back to? That they were specifically commanded against? What, Brian? Idolatry. Well, that just happens over and over in the Old Testament, doesn't it? They go back to idols. Idols of other nations, idols of their own making, instead of worshiping who? The one true God. When we walk away from the truth of who the Son of God is, because has that not been his point is to teach us who the Son of God is through chapters 1 through 4? When we walk away from the truth of who the Son of God is, then we walk away from worshiping the one true God. And when we walk away from worshiping the one true God, we will struggle to discern between good and evil because what? Our focus will be on what's counterfeit and not the one true bill. The evil that he speaks of here is anything that is works-based righteousness in man. That's, that's, that's the evilness he's speaking of. Anything that is works-based righteousness in mankind that's the evil he's talking about. The good is anything that is consistent with Jesus Christ and his whole word. The good is anything that is consistent with Jesus Christ and his whole word. So believers exhibit a growing maturity that practices and trains their senses. Your capacity to discern. When you are looking to Christ, when you are knowing more of Christ in his word, your capacity to discern is being trained. Just a simple illustration, and I know it's been used in other places, and I know it's not completely always foolproof, but take the instance of Peter wanting to get out of the boat. The idea of the context. Now, we're not walking on water every day. It's not about miracles here. It's the idea, though. Who and what is your focus? Is the word of God your focus so that you're knowing more of the one true living God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ? Or all the other competing mentalities in the world are those things distracting you and they're becoming your focus? So much so that you're, they're your focus to the point that you can no longer discern between what's really evil and good. And so you start to say, you know what? I think I'll go back over here. These things were easier to identify I'll just do A, B, C, and D and call myself good.
These believers who exhibit this growing maturity, they discern discern the insufficiency of works-based righteousness. They discern the insufficiency. It's just not sufficient. Milk is great for a while for a baby, but it is not sufficient for that baby to grow into an adult. They need some other food. They discern the comprehensiveness of faith in the righteousness of Christ alone. They they discern the comprehensiveness of faith in the righteousness of Christ alone. You know, I'm going to end with this illustration. One of the things that you learn as you as you you know, you start to grow up, and I'll, I'll never for, forget the first time I, when I was a, an older teenager, paid my car insurance, and I got comprehensive coverage on my car insurance. Does comprehensive coverage on your car insurance mean that it, it covers and pays for absolutely anything and everything? But now, how do we think of the word comprehensive? And it's a little bit of a revelation you know, when you're a teenager paying your car insurance for your first time and and you start asking questions about it and, well, does it cover this? Does it cover that? Well, no, it doesn't cover that. It'll cover this, but only up to uh, this far. Well, does it cover that? No, it doesn't really cover that. But it will cover this only up to this far. But wait, this is comprehensive. Yeah, I know. But comprehensive has this definition in insurance. Well, this is the way the Jew was working. The Jew was working thinking they had comprehensive coverage through the law if they lived the law rightly and properly in an external sense. And really, it was comprehensive coverage from their perspective, but it did not cover everything. The only comprehensive coverage to deal with the covenant in Adam, in the first Adam, is the comprehensive coverage of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It literally and truly covers it all. Right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you've been merciful to give us your word today that we could spend just a little bit of time in it. We ask for the mercies of your Holy Spirit to grow us in the truths of these things that we would see them rightly and we would focus on the genuine, true Son of God and learn and grow in Him according to the word of righteousness in Him. And we would not lean on our own understanding. Give us wisdom by the power of your spirit. If there's anyone that has not repented and believed in you, and they are training themselves in their own human righteousness, please, Lord, by the power of your spirit, intervene. They would no longer lean on their own understanding. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.